Thank you, Jake. Um, it's about a month ago that Tina Morley, the church warden, said to me, would I do a talk uh, to launch this fundraising appeal? So I said, yeah, all right, fine enough. Uh, what do you want? And she said, well, something similar to your Wilberforce evening. For anybody who wasn't at that, back in November, we did an event here in church about the 250th anniversary of William Wilberforce coming to Pocklington. He went on and was voted the greatest ever Yorkshireman. And on that night, we read some extracts from his anti-slavery speech to Parliament that has been called the greatest speech in history. So I thought, OK, I've got to do something similar about a four metre by four metre tiled floor. <laughs> so I thought, well, how can I make things entertaining? Well, everybody likes a quiz. So interspersed in to the information I'll be telling you about the porch and its floor, I'm going to chuck in some local history questions that pertain to the church and the porch, and not only that, the magnificent prizes are also connected to the church and the porch. And so for the first question, this isn't the question, this is the prize. Uh, the prize is a bottle of Tio Pepe Sherry, which you all know comes from Pocklington. <laughs> Tio Pepe is produced by the Gonzales Bias uh, Winery and uh, it, the company was formed by the Bias family who were rope makers in Pocklington for 150 years until William Bias left Pocklington in the 1760s and became a Church of England vicar. He obviously worshipped here as a boy for many years and his father was the church warden here. But then from William Bias's family, they created the Gonzales Bias Winery. So if you get this question right, you've got a choice of a bottle of Tio Pepe Sherry or a piece of broken tile from the church porch. <laughs> so the question is, what is the link between Kate, the Duchess of Sussex and those playground, sorry, Duchess of Cambridge, uh, and those playground implements that we all played on as children or pushed our children on or even possibly pushed your grandchildren on? Oh dear. <laughs> uh, it looks as though I'm going to have to drink sherry tonight. So the answer, of course, is this man, who you will all recognise in typical pose. That's the Vicar of Pocklington in 1885 when the porch floor was laid down. Have you got that? So here we go. The Kate, the Duchess of Cambridge, is from one branch of the Wicksteed family. The chap in the middle, who was Vicar of Pocklington, is John Henry Wicksteed. And on the right, the children's playground stuff is all made by the, another branch of the Wicksteed family. So, shame, you could have had a bottle of sherry there. So, <laughs> but, uh, so, here we go. John Henry Wicksteed, who was Vicar of Pocklington for 17 years, during the time of the appeal to create the porch and the porch floor. And he was a pretty remarkable guy. 
Jake will be honoured to know he's following in the footsteps of a guy who was regarded as a great preacher of the word. He might be less keen to know that John Wicksteed got things done and if anything got in his way, put his hand in his pocket and paid for it. The church owes him a great debt because uh, as we, you know, it's still light and we can look out on the pavement and across the bottom of George Street, if you'd have 150 years ago stood outside the station hotel, you couldn't have seen All Saints. There was a row of shops and cottages all along the pavement and John Wicksteed came to Pocklington in 17, uh, sorry, 1876, and he wasn't happy with that, so he immediately put his hand in his pocket and started buying out the ownership of all the properties along there and knocked them down. And so Pocklington now has a vista. It used to be something probably like Market Wheaton, where as you walked along the marketplace, you can't see the church. So we owe him a great debt for that. I'm not so sure about some of his other bits, but they were of his time. Uh, Pocklington Church looks very similar in structure to what it did 200 years ago, but it used to be quite brightly coloured and the Victorians liked, liked things nice and clean and simple and lots of the church were plastered and coloured and you can actually see in a few places like up there and on a couple of those pillars the, the main pillars were bright red. Wicksteed brought a horse and cart into the church and got volunteers to scrape the plaster off. They took four cartloads of coloured plaster out of the church to make it as it is today. I've said he was a great preacher. He was a man of significant energy. He used to uh, travel the world and there was no TV, there was even no radio. He used to do magic lantern talks of his travels and so he went around the East Riding and he did a talk about his visit to Japan, to the Sudan and that photograph in the middle was after he'd been on pilgrimage to the Holy Land and he came back and did a talk about that. He talked about climbing in the Pyrenees and traveling across Europe and he charged for his talks and a lot of that went towards the porch appeal. The uh, church wardens and John will be going, looking fairly pale and sick if I tell them the original porch cost and floor cost £176, and of which Wicksteed himself contributed £25, and he raised another 15 by doing his talks around the district. They have said he got things done and knocked all that down. He was also a antiquarian. Um, his wife bought him a uh, magnifying glass for their golden wedding because by then he'd moved to the south of England and he used to go and spend all day in the British Museum. Uh, but he also was a conjurer and he composed hymns and he was a leading member of the Church of England initiative to try and get the Jewish faith to come into the Anglican Church. And so he was a very busy man and we are told that the porch was crumbling when he arrived and he was trying to patch it up himself. He used to uh, go with a, a bucket and mortar and, and try and patch it up until on the 11th and 12th of 
December in 1883, there was a great storm and it blew the porch down. Did a lot of other damage all across the country. There were numerous people killed as far south as London. There were ships wrecked and sailors drowned. Bradford lit up the world because in Bradford it blew over the gasometer and it landed on a gas lamp, it didn't explode, it just lit it up and so you could see the sky glowing throughout the north of England as thousands of cubic feet of gas lit this great uh, massive gas lamp in Bradford and in Pocklinton it blew the porch down but we were quite lucky it didn't blow the whole church down. You might struggle to uh, just see that but the church in 1885 wasn't in a particularly wonderful state and if you look at how uh, vertical that pillar and that pillar are they were leaning inwards massively and they put a wooden beam across to stop the church collapsing and the great storm in uh, 1883 took half the roof off but the church stayed up. They had to put it on props and rebuild. You can see which uh, columns are original and which ones these. You know, all of this is, is a new build, original, new build, original. Uh, so the church was very lucky that it, it stayed up. But it did start off a major restoration project that took another 15 years and the porch and the porch floor which is why we're here tonight was the part was uh, the first start of that and what you've got there is the original porch there and the new porch there doesn't look that different apart from the fact that uh, they put stained glass windows in the new porch and there's a poster at the back, but uh, if you want to know more about the stained glass windows, you can come back in June when Sue Bond is going to do a talk uh, about all the Victorian stained glass in, the, uh, in here, including the uh, windows in the porch. I won't tell you anything about those because I'm not gonna steal her thunder, but they used a lot of the original material from the blown down porch into building the new one. It was uh, the architect supervisor of it was the diocesan architect, Frederick Broderick, and he restored dozens of churches across the East Riding. Uh, there's one that uh, my wife and I know quite well. They, he built the Catholic Church in Beverly. He rebuilt a major part of Water Priory and some of the ornamental cottages in Water are of his designs. So this was a fairly simple job for Frederick Broderick uh, in rebuilding the porch. And so it was done fairly quickly. They got a significant boost right at the start because when the porch blew down, there was a magpie's nest in the roof and in it were three Georgian silver coins that were over 150 years old and so that was the initial contribution to the church appeal in 1884 was the uh, the magpie <laughs> and on you don't need to try and uh, read that but uh, on the right there that's the press report of the um, uh, the service for the opening of the uh, uh, the new porch and on the left 
is the Parish Magazine of May 1885 when it was opened. And you can just see, you know, it surprised me when I got a copy of the Parish Magazine, but there was advertising and sponsorship in 1885. And the main sponsor of the Parish Magazine was Yorkshire Relish, the world's most famous brown sauce in 1885. There is a very close connection to this church and so my next question is, and there is a choice, you can have a bottle of Yorkshire Relish sauce or a piece of broken porch tile. So if anybody can tell me the connection between Goodall and Backhouse's Yorkshire Relish brown sauce and All Saints Pocklington. <laughs> I'm going to have a wild night tonight, sherry and brown sauce, okay? <laughs> the answer is that memorial stone over there to the Powell family. Uh, hands up everybody who's heard of Powell and Young Solicitors. Right, that, too late. <laughs> there were two branches of the Powell family in Pocklington. There were the solicitors and there were the grocers and drapers. And where Costa Coffee is now used to be Powell's grocers and drapers shop. And one of the younger Powell's went into business with his brother-in-law, who was called Robert Goodall, and he was the son of the landlord of the Half Moon at Market Wheaton, and they took the, uh, his mother's uh, family recipe for brown sauce and turned it into a, the most popular sauce in the world. And at the time of that, they had a factory in Leeds. At their prime, they were uh, producing 13 million bottles of Yorkshire Relish brown sauce a year. Uh, it got sold to various multinationals and uh, disappeared, but you can still buy it in Ireland. So I'm quite pleased nobody got the question right, because. I did have to go to Schlego to buy that, uh, uh, however, so I will uh, take that home. But they were obviously very rich and they were a Pocklington and Market Wheaton family. The Powells built Burnby Hall and they sold it to Major Stewart. And so that's the connection between Pocklington's uh, parish magazine of uh, the time when the porch was uh, opened and with Yorkshire Relish Sauce and Powell and Young Solicitors. Uh, you're not doing very well with your quiz so far, but we, we will battle on. So that's the press report of the opening service. And in it, there was an organ so solo by the man on the left, who's John Thomas Lamb. And the organ in 1885 totally blocked off that uh, south transept there. Sorry, that's a north transept. All right, uh, I'm allowed three mistakes. But, uh, and he played on that night the March of the Jewish Warriors by George Shin. And, and that's, you know, tonight's all about connections. And uh, that's a, a bit of an interesting story in itself. George Shin was from a very poor London family. Uh, so poor, his parents couldn't afford to send him to school. But he, on a Sunday, used to go to the local church Sunday school and he started singing in the choir and the vicar let him have a play on the organ and from that he'd been at the age of seven 
He'd been put to work in the family joinery business, but he became a organist and a composer. He got a Bachelor of Music degree from Cambridge, and in 1875, he composed the March of the Jewish Warriors, which sounds like a bit of an odd choice, but as I've said, the Reverend Wicksteed was a person who was uh, at the forefront of trying to bring the Jewish faith and the Anglican faith closer together. Part of my job tonight is to try and take you all back to when the porch was first created and first opened. And so what we're going to do is musically take you back to 1885. I've said this is all about connections and it just so happens that when I spoke to our august organist, Michael Cooper, uh, could he find and play that? He found that the piece of music had been dedicated by uh, George Shin to the publisher of the Musical Herald, who was a man called Spencer Kerwin, and it just so happens that Spencer Kerwin is an ancestor of Michael's wife. So <laughs> I will hand you over to Michael, who's going to take you back to May 1885 and the original opening of the porch.
Thank you, Michael. John Thomas Lamb couldn't have played it any better. Uh, as I've said, the porch collapsed, but the church stayed up. But you'll wonder why I lugged these big lumps of stone uh, up at the beginning. Um, when the restoration is complete, as you walk out, a lot of people miss it, but there are a few bits of Norman stonework over the top of the door as you go out. And they fell to the ground when the porch fell down. There are various bits of these. The original Norman church, we reckon, was within the curtail of these main pillars. And so when the church was extended and the porch was built, they removed what would have been a classic Norman doorway or Norman chancellor arch. Uh, you still see a few other bits and pieces. Um, there's an odd beakhead uh, up there that will have been from the original doorway or, uh, or chancel arch. And some of those were discovered when the church uh, porch fell down. But we're not here to talk about the porch. We're here about the floor. And I must admit on that, it, that photo was taken, I think, five years ago from a distance. It don't look that bad. Uh, but uh, as you get closer up, uh, it, it is. Uh, you wouldn't quite believe that uh, some of the areas from that distance that look okay are that bad. But what makes Pocklington uh, Porch special is that the uh, tiles are made by the world famous Minton factory and the designs are by the even more world famous architect Augustus Pugin, who is known as the father of Gothic revival. And that's Pugin on the left. Uh, he was the greatest architect of the 19th century. Um, his crowning glory is the Houses of Parliament or uh, Palace of Westminster, but he built cathedrals in Australia, England, and in Ireland, and he died at the age of 40. So goodness knows what greatness he would have gone on to if he'd have lived longer. On the right is Herbert Minton, and he was, he inherited his father's pottery business in Stoke-on-Trent, and he was quite a pottery entrepreneur. And he and Pugin started uh, investigating how to reinvent a, the encaustic clay tile that had been so popular in medieval times. This is Pocklington's uh, porch a few days ago. And uh, as you can see, there's uh, a lot of work to do, but we are following in the footsteps of some uh, pretty important places. That's, I've said about the Houses of Parliament, stroke Palace of Westminster, they have a Minton and Pugin tiled floor, and that needed a complete restoration last year. And it, it took, I think, uh, several months, but it, it was completed last year. And not only was the Palace of Westminster are we following, that's York Minster last year, and that's their chapter house uh, tile floor, which again is by uh, Minton Tiles, uh, designed by Pugin, 
and it needed a complete restoration as well. And that took five months and I think was uh, uh, reopened again in March. So, another question. And this time, your, uh, your prize is a Minton, genuine Minton uh, cup and saucer. Or what? Yeah, a, a broken piece of, of tile. And that's what is the connection between Herbert Minton and Pocklington Church. Oh, did I see a hand up there? <laughs> Shout it out. Robert. Correct. We, yeah, we, we've got an incomer. Uh, the person who sneak, snuck in at the back uh, is uh, the Reverend Val Hewitson, who just happened to be the uh, vicar of Bambi Moor and is a distinguished Bambi Moor historian. And she said, Robert Taylor. And the Reverend Robert Taylor of Bambi Moor just happened to marry Herbert Minton's sister. And so uh, we, and he was the vicar of Bambi Moor. He had close connections to this church because he, uh, he, he had a few quid and uh, he used to um, pay the vicar of Pocklinton and the headmaster of Pocklinton School to preach his sermons for him, particularly as he got older. Uh, but he was that direct link with Minton and with our church floor. And that's him on the right. On the left is a, uh, uh, a, 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 a tile that the Minton factory made uh, to uh, place on the floor of Bambi Moor Church uh, for his wife. Would you like a Minton cup of tea, Val, or a piece of broken uh, tile? You'll have in a piece of tile, oh dear. All right, good. <laughs> Minton factory was enormous and immense. They uh, mainly did uh, originally stuff like this. Um, I went over the road to All Sorts Antique Shop the other day and she's lent me a Minton plate and when I looked at the markings on the back, it just so happens that that was made in the same year as Pocklinton's porch was, was laid. But they were pretty uh, big in terms of uh, 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 production down there. And so the other question is, what's Augustus Pugin's connection to Pocklinton? Don't all shout at once. Okay, well, Augustus Pugin, who was probably the world's top architect in the mid-19th uh, century, his agent was Charles Dolman of the Pocklinton Dolman family. And what you've got there on the left is that's the last Pocklington Dolman Lord of the Manor. They'd been bankrupt for years. If they turned up on, in Pocklington, they would get assaulted in the street for, because of the uh, debts that they hadn't paid. And they were in a total uh, state with themselves. But in the middle of the 19th century, that guy's uh, grandson, John Thomas Dolman, he became a doctor in York, married well, and he re-established the family fortunes. 
and he was the person who restored his ancestors' uh, memorial in the Lady Chapel. So the Thomas Dolmer Memorial was, uh, again, in a pretty bad state, but he uh, put it into what, how it looks today. His cousin was the country's major Catholic publisher, and he published lots of uh, Pugin's writings and, uh, and works. So we have a direct connection to Minton and a direct connection to Putin, Jin. And the pair of them combined and they, I said that Herbert Minton had reinvented or, or uh, encaustic clay tiles. If you look at the top there, you've got the Pocklington church floor and particularly you've got those fleur-de-lis uh, you know, patterns below are a series of fleur-de-lis clay tiles from the 13th, 14th, 15th century. What had happened is every monastery, every cathedral, every palace had tiles just like our porch until the Reformation. And when Henry dissolved the monasteries, then the ability to make clay tiles fell out of fashion and they, it remained like that for a couple of hundred years. When I talk about them, there is a massive difference between a clay tile which is basically made out of different patterns of clay. And uh, so that's a light clay and a dark clay. And the average glazed tile where you paint or transfer onto something and then glaze it. These were what were popular in all the des reses in medieval times, but then disappeared in the 1500s, and it was only after uh, Pugin and Minton rediscovered the technique that they suddenly came back, and they went around the world. And so you will again now find uh, Minton tiles in not only the Palace of Westminster and York Minster and Pocklington Church, but in the doorways of Victorian terrace houses or in stately homes that were redone, as well as in a lot of churches. Pocklington's unusual to have uh, its tiles in the porch. You'll find quite a lot of churches will have the uh, sanctuary or the, the chancel in uh, clay tiles, but uh, I haven't come across many that have got a porch like that. But there you've got the exact same pattern of the fleur-de-lis, um, which was said to have been adapted into the French aristocracy by Clovis when he was converted to Christianity and then transferred over from the French kings to the English kings and and so that's their uh, pattern going back for going on for a thousand years. Pugin was a Catholic and this is another tile from uh, Pocklington Porch that shows the Coptic cross and its religious significance is it said that the different arms of the cross, those three parts are Father, Son and Holy Ghost and then the four arms of the cross mean that there are 12 and that's the 12 apostles so you'll find the same with lots of the different parts of Pocklington uh, porch floor have particular religious significance I said about Robert Taylor and Bambi Moore and there you have again the uh, fleur-de-lis 
uh, in Bambi Moor Church and they actually inserted a tile uh, as a memorial to Herbert Minton. Uh, I would, uh, I wish that I could have been talking about Bambi Moor Church and its tiles rather than Pocklington Church porch because life would have been so much simpler. But, you know, stay with me, it gets a bit complicated. Herbert Minton was the guy who invented, they are reinvented the clay tiles. He inherited the pottery from his father, Thomas Minton, and he left it to his two sons, but his eldest son, Thomas, uh, he had a calling and he left the pottery business and became an Anglican uh, vicar. And he was vicar of Darlington for 20 years. And so Herbert Minton was the guy who was left running the pottery. But he died in 1858. He had uh, no sons, uh, but several sisters and he left his pottery works to his three nephews. Michael Hollins, who had originally trained as a doctor in Manchester, but then joined uh, his uncle. Colin Campbell uh, from Liverpool, who also joined the business, and Robert Minton Taylor, the son of uh, the vicar of Bambi Moor, who was born at Yapham because Bambi Moor didn't have a vicarage until the Reverend Taylor built one. And all three of them, there were significant uh, age gaps between them, but they took over the business and fairly quickly started falling out. Uh, they uh, were part of a major family falling out uh, in 1861 over the uh, will of grandfather Thomas Minton and uh, the wording, because he'd left the business to his sons, but he'd left a trust fund to his daughters, and the, uh, the infighting on that went all the way to the High Court, and then when they inherited the business, originally, uh, Michael Hollins was the production guy, Colin Campbell was a salesman, and Robert Taylor was the youngest, and he was the junior partner. They started falling out. Robert Taylor went off and uh, created his own company, making clay tiles. The business was split between Michael Hollins keeping the tile part of the business and Colin Campbell take, keeping the plates and cups and, uh, and all the, the china and pottery side, uh, but that didn't settle down. They started taking each other to court as to who owned the Minton name and who had rights for this part of the business and that part, and there were enormous sums uh, spent on it. If you look at the... Uh, can we uh, move it on? The battery must be getting low, Les. If you look at the uh, tiles uh, in, from the porch, they're Minton tiles, but they say the Campbell Tile Company because, like I say, the business split up into various parts and they were each using the Minton tile name and then took each other to court. So Pocklington's porch, the floor is Minton tiles, but it's made by the Campbell Tile Company, who was a Minton. Stay with me. Uh, and it got even more complicated because if people ordered tiles from one company, they often subcontracted to the other because they couldn't make that. So all the brown and uh, buff tiles 
were made by Campbell, even if they ordered them off, uh, uh, off the other part of the business who were still taking each other to court. So there's no question that we've got mint and tiles, but they don't say mint and, uh, on them. It's all right, next one. So back to uh, our floor and uh, what happened in the end with all of this infighting was I think Robert Taylor as the young man, he'd had enough and he emigrated to America. That wasn't unusual in round about 1880. There were thousands of people around here went from East Yorkshire to America. Uh, we did a talk with the history group a couple of years back that there were 90 people from Pocklington and Barnby Moor all emigrated to Detroit. Several of them were brick makers and uh, people in, used to working in clay. Robert Taylor, he went to Indianapolis and he took over the United States Encaustic Tile Company and started producing tiles over there. And there are some of uh, their tiles in the White House. But he died young in 1883. And so luckily for us, his father was still vicar of Bambi Mo for a few years, even though he was uh, becoming increasingly inf uh, infirm. And so he could have his family connections to get the uh, Pocklington porch uh, up and running. And uh, so I said earlier that one of my jobs is to try and transport you back to the 19th century. And I only found a couple of days ago a, uh, the last thing that Robert Taylor did in Stoke-on-Trent before he emigrated to America was to create a pattern book of encaustic tiles. And I've looked at many of these floors in uh, the last few months while I've been researching this and I couldn't find anything that looked like Pocklington. It looked quite unique, uh, which I thought was a little bit odd until I found Robert Minton Taylor's pattern book. And that's one of the flaws in its book. And that's the, uh, one of the several pages of ranges of tiles. And so that made, suddenly made sense that I could just envisage going back to 1884 and the Vicar of Pocklington and the church wardens going over a book and saying, well, I've one of them and three of them and a few of them. And they created the encaustic tiled floor that you see today. And so I think that makes Pocklington's floor doubly uh, important and so I think that's enough from me for now. If you uh, were uh, struggling to see some of me, uh, uh, my slides and photos in some detail, um, I've printed a couple of po copies out. There's two at the back of church. We'll leave them there, and so you can come in any time that you're uh, passing and uh, have a look through. But uh, hopefully from this, we can uh, again put uh, hundreds of tiles and thousands of feet back to the pristine uh, condition it was in 1885. Thank you.